All right, Mishpaha, we're back. Um, I'm back. And let's see what happens. Hopefully uh, this time it sticks and we can uh, do the show. So, man, that's two weeks in a row. It's like everything trying to stop this show from coming. I don't know. So, see what happens. God's favor. Um, last night didn't have no internet. Um, weren't able to do triple T. We're going to have to get a hold of our um, internet company out here and see what's going on because it seems to be certain times of the week too or certain times of the day. I don't know if, you know, because Shavo just ended here or is ending. Um, and so people might be jumping on the internet and if you're getting a whole load of people getting on the internet, that'll mess it up too. So, all right, but enough with that said, I'm going to blow the show far and uh, get into this. So. So, let's jump into it. Let's talk prophecy. You know what the show's about. Um, getting into the word, getting into the topics. Very much like tour talk time. You guys, it's opportunity for people to be able to... Uh, um, for people to be able to ask the kind of questions to get into this discussion on end time prophecy and we will get into the word. So I imagine, you know, the show will go at least an hour, uh, possibly to an hour and a half, um, all depending on the topic we get into. I figure we should be able to cover a couple topics each show, all depending on how in depth and as I talked last week. And as, uh, as you saw, anybody who watched last week's first episode, um, it was really easy to get off on a lot of rabbit trails because everything is intertwined. I mean, really, everything about end time prophecy is just woven into each other and connected together and stuff. So uh, is everything, so if everybody would give me a quick thumbs up real quick, let me know that are we staying consistent? Is Am I clear? Can you hear me good? Does it seem like it's doing well? Or am I still freezing up and locking up? All right, so looks like we're good. So glad to see everybody on here. So uh, let's get it started. Anybody got um, any questions? Shalom, Angie, uh, Shane Stokes, my wife, Angela, uh, uh, Mary, Glenda Newton, BG Towers. Anybody else on here I'm missing? Sally, all right, there's Chucky, okay, all right you guys, so if any of you got a question, let's, let's get it started, Cassandra Rosenbaum, welcome.
All right. Shalom, Joyce. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea, babe. I have no idea. As far as who the Antichrist is going to be, I mean, if I was to share one thought, I definitely have... Uh, I have Nimrod as, as a potential candidate. So that's because if history is correct, he was beheaded and they found his body in 99 and they found a resurrection chamber in Iraq in 03. So I know that they're talking about the rumor was that they were going to try and resurrect him. So that would definitely be a fulfillment of Revelation 13 when it says that he received a deadly wound and his wound was healed um, and the world marveled at his wound. So yeah, that would definitely uh, make people take notice. Okay, so Chuck Booth. Um, now everybody's asking questions now. All right, getting a little slow started tonight. It's okay. So who is the prince in the East Hat, East Gate? Well, there are, there are some scriptures that talks. I I know that some talk about David being. Uh, the prince in millennial reign. Now, my stance has always been, I, I've always thought, no way, because why would Yah bring David back to life in a sinful flesh? Because in Ezekiel 45 and 46, we see the prince make sacrifice and offering for himself before he takes care of making sacrifice and offering for the people. Uh, so that's in, that's in Ezekiel 45, especially. There's, uh, it talks all about that. So, but um, one of the things I'm just kind of coming to the point on is, you know, unless it goes against Torah, Yah's not going to do anything against Torah. Um, Yah can do what he wants. Let's see, let me bring that verse up for you here real quick. There's a couple of them. All right, Vey. Let's just... Phone just doesn't... Internet's acting up on the phone too. Seems like we're still good on here though, so hopefully it stays that way. Alright, so uh, there's a couple places, but one of the ones, um, Ezekiel 37 verse 24, we know that Ezekiel 37 talks about the dry bones, okay? It's the resurrection of Israel in the last days, which happened in 1948, uh, which was the beginning of it, let's put it that way. But Ezekiel 37, 24 says, My servant David will be king over them. Now this says that he will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. Obviously, David's not going to be king because Yeshua is going to be king. Yeshua will rule and reign as king. So in that aspect, David would qualify in that because out of, from his, um, from Judah comes the king. And he said, from, and Yah told David, from, from you shall be the, the, the one. Um, let's see, the other one that I want to give you is Hosea 3, 5, I believe. Also, Ezekiel 34. So let's go back. Ezekiel 34, verses 23 and 
And it's so much faster doing this with my Bible than on the phone, especially when it doesn't want to act right. All right, so Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, Yehovah, will be their Elohim, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, Yehovah, have spoken. And see, that one right there is probably one of the most convincing. And, and this, is, this is why so many, um, especially in Judaism, you know, uh, that they say that, you know, that David will, will come back as king. And or I'm sorry, as uh, as the prince, and why even a lot of people in, in the messianic um, and Hebrew roots congregations say the same thing. Now, like I said, my stance used to be no way on it um, because I thought, to me, I thought it was double jeopardy. Why would Yah bring David back? And I still may be right on that. And it may be that what this is literally referring to is that he will be of the line of David. I don't know. Who knows? But if it is David, we know that Yehovah Yeshua is the one who will rule from the Ezekiel temple. And, and as far as the prince, I mean, except for like verses like this and Hosea, what was the other one? Um, I think it was Hosea 3, 5. Or... See. Yeah, Hosea 3 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yehovah their Elohim and David their king. They shall fear Yehovah and his goodness in the latter days. See, now to me, that. I don't know, to me, on, on that particular type of verse, I have to, because we know that Yeshua comes from the tribe of Judah, as far as in the physical flesh, when he came in the flesh, that he's of the tribe of Judah, which is David. So, the thing that I, my issues with there is, I, I think that that points to Yeshua, because it says, David shall be king. And they shall fear Yehovah and his goodness in the latter days, because Yehovah will be king. So that's pretty much all you can do on that one. Everything else is just going to be guessing. Um, now, just to reiterate everything, everybody, um, I don't, I'm getting a lot of questions. We're, unless these are able to be short, we're not going to be able to. Uh, cover all these so I just want to reiterate that unless there's short ones like this who's the prince there's not a lot you can get into with that all right so the next question is my wife's um, all the are the bulls and the horns or shofars concurrent so this this one's a lot of fun to get into because to me, there's no question about the seven bowls and the seven trumpet judgments that happen in the tribulation period run concurrent. And the best way to explain that is for us to just get into it and read it. So let's turn to Revelation. And I want to do a comparison between the two so that you can see for yourself uh, and make your own judgment on it as to if you think it they run concurrent or consecutive. All right, so the beginning of the seven uh, seven trumpets starts in uh, Revelation chapter eight, verse seven, and then also put your finger in uh, Revelation sixteen. Verse 2. 
So Revelation 16.2 for the bowls and Revelation 16.7 to start out the trumpets. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and forth between the two and compare the scriptures on them. One to one, two to two, three to three, so on and so forth. So first of all, we have in the first trumpet, we had the first angel sound sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The first bowl. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So right out the bat, the first one, people would be like, okay, those are two different things. All right, so let's continue. Second trumpet. And some, um, the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Second bowl. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood, as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. So here we have these first two. Um, first, second bowl, se second trumpet sound like the exact same event. Third trumpet. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Third bowl. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Yehovah, the one who is, who was, and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Yehovah El Shaddai, true and righteous are your judgments. So the third, where did it go? So the third trumpet is the water struck. The third bowl is the waters turned to blood. First it was the seas turned to blood in the second bowl. Now it's all the rivers, springs of waters, and everything became blood. So, and the wormwood, I know that a lot of people um, try to declare different things. And they also, there's some asteroid called wormwood that's coming and stuff like that. And... I, I don't dismiss it. Very well may be true. Uh, fourth trumpet. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So that was the fourth trumpet. The fourth bowl. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of Elohim, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, to me, the first four of each has some similarities and, and some not. But to me, getting down to these last ones, these last few, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, this was what was convincing to me, is, at least to me. And I don't declare it to be a fact. I mean, <laughs> when the tribulation gets here, and if we still happen to be here, we'll find out what happens. We'll see it for ourselves. But um, if they're consecutive or not, or concurrent. So the fifth trumpet. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. 
So the sun and the air were dark, uh, were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of Elohim on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months." Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like the horse's bridle. I'm sorry, it was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there was stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, behold, still more woes are coming after these things. So it's pretty detailed on the fifth bowl, or on the fifth trumpet. So here's the fifth bowl. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the L of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Now, to me, I think that there's a correlation there between the two because the sting of the, scorp of the locust causes great pain for five months and they, to the point that they even seek death but cannot find it. So many think that that, that's... That, that means that Yah is not going to allow people to commit suicide, that they're going to have to deal with the suffering and the pain of what uh, they're dealing with from the sting of the scorpion, or locust. And then the same thing is what is said here in the uh, fifth bowl, is darkness and pain. So you have... And... Okay, so here's the other thing, too, that's similar. Verse 2, He opened the bottomless pit, the smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke in the pit. We're talking about the bottomless pit. I mean, there's no telling how horrific this is going to look. The fifth bowl describes... Um, utter darkness coming over the earth, and then the pain uh, of gnawing of their tongues. Let's see. Okay, so, yeah. So the kingdom of the beast became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. All right, so let's, let's go to the next one. Um, the sixth trumpet. Now, these two... These two, it just is as it gets closer to the last ones, it just seems to be more and more apparent. At least that's my opinion on it. So, um, okay. So the sixth trumpet. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind 
By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay, so let's go to the sixth bowl. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So we're talking about the same event right there, talking about the armies that will come from the east across the Euphrates River, which there are places right now, Mishpaha, uh, certain parts of the Euphrates River which is completely dried up. You could actually walk across certain spots on it right now. I came across uh, some footage on it a couple years ago. And um, so right here, both things. You got the great river Euphrates uh, in both of these incidences. You got the armies coming across uh, in both of these incidences. And then everything else that pertains with it. But let me finish reading this. Uh, I'm going to reread it. So the sixth bowl, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates and its waters was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. Did you catch that? Performing signs, these demons, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of El Shaddai. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. All right, so now here comes the, the finality of these two. The seventh trumpet first. Then the seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Adon and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before uh, Elohim on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped El, saying, We give you thanks, O Yehovah Elohim Almighty, the one who is, was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of Elohim was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hell. So now, let's look at the seventh bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. I personally believe that that is Zechariah 14.4, when Yeshua steps on the Mount of Olives, and I can get into that in a minute. Now the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before Elohim to give her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away. The mountains were not found. Great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed Elohim because of the plague of the hell since that plague was exceedingly great. 
So in both of those, you go back and you read seven trumpet, seventh bowl. They're both describing the exact same event. Event. They're both describing that it's it's finished. It's at the end. Um, the the seventh trumpet. They're saying the kingdoms of the earth has now become the kingdoms of our God. Uh, they're both describing uh, noises, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake, hail, um, and so now with the earthquake. A um, few years back, I did a study on all the tech, all the uh, fault lines in the world, and here's what I found to be interesting. Because now this is where we get off on rabbit trails. If you go to Ezekiel chapter forty, no, I'm sorry. If you go to Zechariah fourteen, I don't know why I was thinking of Ezekiel. Zechariah fourteen. Um, let me go there real quick because I'm going to uh, touch on a couple verses. But Zechariah 14, first of all, what I learned in my research about the uh, fault lines was this. Zach, uh, there is a uh, fault line that goes east to west directly down the middle of the uh, Mount of Olives, where Yeshua steps down on. There's a big, huge earthquake fault line that goes right down the middle of the entire um, um, Mount of Olives and goes west right into the, um, the uh, Temple Mount and into Jerusalem. Okay? Now, we have the description. Now, they're saying that from what I read, that fault line, if it ever erupts, it's going to be a massive, massive earthquake. Okay? Well, it's interesting because that's exactly what it's going to be. When you read Zechariah 14, it says, starting in verse 4, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Because... If you got the Mount of all. You got the uh, Temple Mount. Here's the East Gate, and here's here's the Mount of Olives. Okay, so it sits facing from the east. Um, making that it says that he will step down the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west. Like I said, the the fault line goes through east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north. Half of the mountain shall move toward the south. Um, then you shall flee through the mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earth in the days of Uzziah, king of Yehuda. Thus Yehovah Elohim will come and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to Yehovah, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Yerushalayim. You can read that in Ezekiel uh, 47. Half of them toward the eastern sea. The Eastern Sea is the Dead Sea, okay? Half of them towards the Western Sea. The Western Sea is the Mediterranean Sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and Yehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be Yehovah's one, his name one. So now, let me give you the confirmation here. You go to Ezekiel chapter 47. And he says, starting at verse 6, now, Yehovah has taken and brought Ezekiel to the door of the temple, the Ezekiel temple that Yeshua will sit upon and rule it from in millennial reign. There, uh, it says that there is water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And so he brought him to this place. And starting at verse 6, it says, he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned there, 
Along the bank of the river, there were many trees on one side and the other. And he said, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. This is the Dead Sea. There are only two seas, and it's not really correct because they call it the Sea of Galilee, but that's not accurate. It's called the Canaret, and it's actually a giant lake. The, the Canaret or the Sea of Galilee is 13 and a half miles long, and I think the widest part of it might be about four miles, maybe five miles wide, um, but I think that might be a little generous. It's at least a few, two to three miles wide at the widest part. But it's 13 and a half miles from top to bottom. The Dead Sea is 11 miles wide at its widest point, and it's 50 miles tall, long, from the top to the bottom. So the Dead Sea, it says that the waters will be healed. Well, the Dead Sea is dead. That's why it's called the Dead Sea, because it's got so much concentration of salt in it, there's no way anything living can be in the Dead Sea. So he's saying right here, he's being told that the, sea, the Dead Sea is going to be healed. Now, and it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be a great multitude of fish. So the Dead Sea is going to be able to be fished in. And this is how we also know, jump down to verse 10. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Glam. Well, En Gedi is at the bottom of the Dead Sea, all the way up to the top. So it's going to come into a place. And then the Western Sea, there's only one Western Sea for in Israel, and that's the Mediterranean Sea. So back to my point is that this valley, this earthquake, when Yeshua steps on the Mount of Olives, the earthquake that's going to happen is going to be magnitude like nobody's ever seen. And, the, and it's going to split from the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea is, give or take, it's like 90 miles Okay, because I think the furthest part width of Israel right now is 90 some miles. So we're talking anywhere between 80 and 90 miles from the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea. That is a huge valley caused by an earthquake. That's, we're talking massive. And so literally the existing Israel today is going to be split in half. It's going to be cut in half. And the northern part's going to move, and the and the, the Negev part, the northern part is going to move forward, and the Negev is going to move south. Everything south of Jerusalem will be leveled out into a plain, and it talks about this in these scriptures as well. Um, but so this massive valley. Uh, from this earthquake, all because Yeshua is stepping down the Mount of Olives, and the water will run from the Ezekiel Temple out the east gate from under the threshold, and it will run down into the valley, and it will split off. Part will go into the Mediterranean Sea, and part will go to the, to the Dead Sea. Now here's the other thing. When you read in the previous verses in chapter 47 of Ezekiel here, you also have, um, what did, uh, I lost my spot. Ezekiel, he goes to measuring verse 3, and when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. So once this valley happened, once the Ezekiel temple's built, and once the water starts flowing from the temple, from the Ezekiel temple, from Yah's uh, throne, this water that's going to flow and fill up this valley will get to the point where the water is too high to walk in, as verse 3 and 4 and verse 5 um, Verse 5, again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And that's where that, that's how the water's going to come about 
from the Ezekiel temple into this valley that will be created by Yehovah Yeshua when he steps down the Mount of Olives and it splits. All of that is going to be the outcome from these things. And so back to what I was talking about with the trumpets and bowls. So we have in here, when you read it, yes, a couple of them do seem to be a little different. And fine, that's fine. You know, Yah does multiple things on, with stuff. But the key things, especially, especially the fifth trumpet bowl, sixth trumpet bowl, and seventh trumpet bowl, they all describe the exact same events, and especially the finishing up. Now, one thing I want to add with this, too. I know that people, there are a lot of people who say that the seals have already been broken. There's a lot of people who say the seal, that we're like in the third or fourth seal. I, I'll tell you something right now, and this is, you know, this is my stance on it. And I, I'm very, very, very adamant on this stance unless somebody can prove me otherwise. The seals have not been broken. We have not even begun the seals because according to what Revelation 6 teaches and everything that follows, the seals will not start until Antichrist is on the scene. And I believe very strongly that the seals will unleash all throughout the tribulation period. Now, they, I, I don't think they'll run concurrent with the, with, uh, with the bowls or the trumpets. But they all describe the events of what's going to happen. Because when you get into what's going on with the seals from the first... The first seal is the conqueror. It says that he goes out conquering and to conquer. This is anti-Messiah. All right? The, all day long. This is the one he is giving. He has it. He comes. Um, he's on a white horse. He, he, he sits on it with a bow and a crown was given to him. He went out conquering and conquering because he claims to be king. He, Satan, Hasatan, is the ruler of the heirs of this world. He is ruler of the earth right now because... There's more wickedness and more perversion and everything else going on. And it's getting worse and worse every day because of where we're at and what we're in. So he will claim to be ruler. Scripture says that he will rule the nations for, for a time. Uh, actually, it says that he will be given authority for 1,260 days. So we know that Hasatan indwelling the anti-Messiah is going to rule the earth as king. And, and however aspects that that is, and from what we understand in Scripture, it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, um, sp specifically I believe it's verse 4, it says that he will declare himself to be God sitting in the, in the, in the temple of God, and, and like I said, declaring that he is God. All right, so and, and all the earth is going to listen. The earth is going to take his mark. Those who are not his saint are not the saints of Yah. They will take the mark of, of the beast and all these things. And all this stuff ties in. So that first seal is anti-Messiah. The second seal, which gives description, I, who knows when and where this will take off. Uh, he opens the second seal, heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And this horse, a fiery horse, it was granted to him who sat on it to take peace from the earth. All right? We know that's going to happen. And, and, and people should kill one another. There was given to him a great sword. We know that violence is going to utterly come across this planet because when the Antichrist comes on the scene, I fully believe that Yehovah is going to pull his hand, he's going to pull his spirit back from all the earth except on those individually who belong to him, those who are the saints. But at this time, this is when we are going to be hunted down, we are going to be slaughtered. The, the, I mean, it's going to be a mass killing of the saints, probably like never has been before, possibly. And we'll get into that in a second. Let's look at the third seal, scarcity on the earth. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, 
do not harm the oil and the wine. So we're talking about basically, to break this down, we're talking about a loaf of bread for a day's wages. It is going to become so bad. And you look at, we have all the signs right now, Mishpaha. We have what's going on um, with, with the way things are happening in the world right now. The way things uh, people are doing, uh, how people are handling the world, how they're destroying the bees, how they're destroying, um, um, what do you call it, um, corn isn't even real anymore, uh, wheat, barley, all these things that they're, they're creating, uh, the they're taking the real seeds and they're bringing in this hybrid stuff. Um, watermelon, another one. If you get a watermelon that has no seeds in it, that is mo that is modified watermelon. That is not real watermelon. That's that uh, phony stuff. Um, you've got, uh, I mean, we could just keep going and keep going and, and all this stuff. And the thing of it is, Mishpaha, is that it's coming to a point where it's getting scarce. We have a, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do two things at the same time here. We have, what do you call it? Um, there's a facility up in near the Antarctic or in Alaska or whatever. They have got every, they've got stockpiles of every seed out there of real food stockpiled in this place for when all hell breaks loose and the world comes to the end and and, and this is from the elite and and people are starving to death and the whole world is starving to death because there's no food this is all a part of this mishpaha and this is what's going on with the third seal here we're not there yet all right and i've heard people say that we're already on the fourth seal so <laughs> Fourth seal, widespread death on the earth. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death. Hades followed with him. Power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now think about this for a second. We have over 8 billion people on this planet. Over 8 billion people live on the earth. And this is saying that a fourth of them will be killed. Now who knows what the number, the numbers are growing like crazy. We may be at 9 billion by the time this part of the tribulation kicks off. I don't even know how far past 8 billion we might be right now. But the point is, at 8 billion, that's 2 billion people on the earth are going to die. That's a fourth. Two billion people. And it says that they will have the name of him who sat on it was death. Hades followed with him. Power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death. Well, no kidding. Because in the previous seal, food and scarcity is going to become across the entire planet. No food, no nothing, a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. So of course, following suit, you're going to have widespread death on the earth. Everybody's going to be killing each other for for a loaf of bread, for a for a cracker, for a jug of water and everything else. And and hunger, death, sword with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. Because the beasts of the earth are also going to be starving because there's no food anywhere because of man's destruction of it all. When he Now let's get to the fifth seal. <clears throat> when he opens the fifth seal, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I saw under the altar the souls, the souls of those who had been slain. So this has already happened because I think this happens. As soon as the first seal opens up, this is when Antichrist becomes Antichrist, as it were. And one of the first things I believe he's going to do in the first six months that he is ruling as 
uh, the Messiah and claiming to be God and stuff, is he is going to put, for lack of better words, the hunting parties out to slaughter all of those who have the testimony of Yeshua and who keep his commandments, Revelation 12, 17. Um, let's see. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw the altar of those who had been slain for the word of Elohim, for the testimony which they held. They cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Yah, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Now you have a continuation of that. Um, let's see. I think it's, uh, let's see, it's in Revelation 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues in them. The wrath of Elohim is complete. I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of El, they sing the song of Moshe, the servant of El, and the song of the Lamb. So these are those who were killed in the, in the great tribulation, um, and they stand before Yah singing. Now, that's a, there's a whole conversation there I could get into, but I'm not going to do that right now. All right. So, so white robe was given to them, um, waiting for the number to be completed. Now, the sixth seal... I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. I honestly believe, Mishpaha, that the sixth seal is in line with the sixth and seventh bowl and trumpet. I, it's like, I don't know, it, it's like a six, a, a seal for every six months kind of thing. Uh, and if you, if you do that, because it's three and a half year tribulation, if you do a seal for every six months, that actually plays out. That's seven seals which covers three and a half years. I'm not declaring that to be a truth. I'm not declaring that to be what it's going to be. But man, it just, it really, it very easily fits because of what happens in each seal. And if you were to line them up that in that six month period, here's the, here's a seal at the beginning of the six months. Here's the trumpet, you know, whatever. But during all this time, we also have the time of Satan's wrath and then the time of Satan of Yehovah's wrath on the people who follow Satan. So, I mean, time will tell. I, uh, ver the sixth seal, I looked when he opened the sixth seal. Okay, I already read all that. Um, verse 13, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth fig, like a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by the wind. The sky recedes as a scroll when it's rolled up. Every mountain and island moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So, I mean, in every aspect, this seems like a picture of Messiah appearing in the sky. A lot of people, especially in the churches, have always taught it, boom, he appears, boom, he's on the Mount of Olives, boom, you know, it's all within a matter of seconds. The only thing that happens in a blink of an eye is when he appears in the sky, the saints, all the saints will be caught up in the air with him. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air with him in that moment. But this describes... An incident where the kings of the earth, the people of the earth, they run for the hills, run for the caves, run to hide, 
crying out for the rocks to fall on them so that the wrath of the Lamb, to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. So there is no telling from the time that He appears, um, all the earth sees it, all the earth panics, and while the earth is running for the hills, we also have an Isaiah where Yeshua is coming down, He comes up from the south along the king's highway, destroying Moab and Edom, and the Moabites and Ammonites and all of them coming up. He's destroying them coming along the king's highway as he's coming in to head to the Mount of Olives, to step down the Mount of Olives and all the things that are happening. I mean, there's no telling. Days, weeks, however, however long Yah wants to allow this to stretch out before he steps on the Mount of Olives and, and all the other things that follow suit with that. Um... So the seventh seal, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, let me look at something real quick. All right. Then another angel, verse 3, then another angel having a golden censer, and this is, I'm sorry, I'm Revelation chapter 8, um, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints ascended before Elohim from the angel's hands, and the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So, now it says in verse 6, and I really want to learn this in the, in the Greek. It says, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound as though this was happening after the seventh seal was opened. Or this is all at the same time for the seventh trumpet or seventh bowl. I don't know, but I, I'd like to study that out more because verse 5 describes the exact same thing as the seventh bowl and the seventh trumpet, which both talk about that there will be noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Now, I'll tell you something, Ms. Ball, and I'm not saying this can't be possible by any means, because Scripture tells us in Daniel 12 that this is going to be a time of tribulation such as never been seen. But... If the seventh seal, the seventh bowl, and the seventh trumpet are all consecutive and not concurrent, consecutive being they are separate events, concurrent being that they're all tied in together as the same event, if they are separate, Ms. Baha, man, we're talking about three mega earthquakes happening and and if that's none of those are the one that Yeshua causes when he steps on the Mount of Olives, no wonder. Either way, it says the earth will shake like a drunkard. And that's going to be crazy. And Mishbahad, we've only broke into what we're getting ready to, to get into every week. I can't believe how fast this time already went. But I don't want to, I'm not going to go to another question tonight because um, we're already over an hour. And I know some of you are going and doing Shavuot. You're getting together with your congregations and stuff. So, but, um, so we'll continue on next week with the next topic. Like I said, it'll always be an hour to hour and a half. Sometimes you might get longer into it, but um, that's a good place to stop. Mishpaha, I encourage you all, and, and, and I want to reiterate, my, the main purpose on my heart with doing this Let's Talk Prophecy program, uh, it's not to figure out date setting, it's not to figure out who's who, it's to, it's to get a very good, thorough understanding and idea of what's happening, um, lining up some of it, getting it lined up that's possible to line up, Figuring out the order of things of the things that we have enough information to lay into an order. 
But the number one thing is really knowing what's in here. To know what it is. Not what the what Bible teachers or prophecy preachers or anything are teaching from their own written books, but really getting straight into Scripture and, and getting all the information. I mean, we got Gog and Magog War, Battle of Armageddon. We got Psalm 83 War. We got the two witnesses. We've got all this stuff. I mean... It's endless plethora of stuff to get into. We've got the millennial reign. And we also got the new heaven and new earth and how that ties in. Because that's end time prophecy as well. That's just the end end time. Um, when this ends and, and eternity with Yehovah begins once and for all. Um, there's and, and all the stuff. Understanding what's going to go on in millennial reign. Understanding how all this works. Um, and, and, and what are we looking at next? I see people on social media all the time saying, Yeshua is going to show up any day or saying, we are, we, you know, it's just any day now that the tribulation is going to start off. It can't be. And that's part of what I want to get into. We have to understand there are some key things that have to happen and there's only a few left. If I understand correctly what I think I understand, there are just a few things left that have to happen to usher in Daniel 9.27 and to ultimately usher in the tribulation period. But these few things are big. They're big events. They are not hidden. They won't be hidden, um, especially here in Israel. They're not going to be hidden, us living in the land, and that's part of the reason why we want to get into because we're going to be able to confirm or deny things that people around the world are claiming. So there are some key things. And and for the, the biggest desire that I'm seeking for everybody to get out of this is when this stuff happens, you're going to recognize it right away because of how thorough we go through the Scriptures on this stuff and how thorough we get into these things on end-time prophecy. Amen? So... Uh, I love you all, Mishpaha. I hope that you really enjoyed the episode tonight. I hope this uh, is something that you feel like is going to be beneficial. And, um, and, may, and above all else, may y'all be praised. May y'all be blessed in this. Um, and may we not profane His name. Amen. May we be careful of what we try to declare of His Word. Uh, and, and be always so humble and ready to know if we're wrong, we need to know that we're wrong and, and, and to be teachable so that we can make sure that we understand. End time prophecy is not salvation essential. It is not essential to your salvation for you to know when the tribulation is going to happen or, in, or who the Antichrist is going to be or whatever. Anybody who tries to make you feel that way, you need to turn away and walk away because they are lying and they are teaching wrong. It is not. This is something for, if Yah made it essential, He would have made it so much more detailed for us to be able to understand every aspect of it. He's giving us an understanding. He's given us an overall view of this is what's happening. These are the things that are going to happen. And here it comes. So that we will not be caught naked and unaware. So that we will not be caught sleeping. Amen? So... Be blessed, Mishpaha. Have an awesome, blessed week. Shavuot Tov. I love y'all, but most of all, y'all loves you. Shalom, shalom.